In the wake of the financial crash of 2008, there was a massive problem. Entrepreneurs and small businesses could not get the money they needed to grow and expand their businesses. HSBC, NatWest, Barclays, Lloyds and Standard Chartered came together to fund a new venture. In 2011, Business Growth Fund was launched to solve this, now going by the name of BGF. The model is simple. They invest one to 20 million for an equity share between 10 and 40%. They're almost like turbocharged dragons. They now have over 3.6 billion investors, almost making the dragons look like mice. Their entire portfolio is now responsible for 60,000 jobs. They are now led by Andy Gregory, who it's fair to say has an unusual background for a growth capital investor. Andy, welcome to Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So tell us how a career that started out in music has led to you running one of the biggest financial services companies in the UK. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, it's not an obvious path for sure. No. Um, and I think there is there is no great uh, rationale behind it. So growing up, music was my you know, number one ob obsession. I absolutely love music. It was sort of happenstance, I think, um, whereby came to a decision point of applying for music colleges, applying for universities. Remarkably, had opportunities to go either way. And um, I think interesting, I guess, insight to your own character, but felt, I just can't turn it down. There's just too good yeah. a chance. So the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester, and a great establishment. And I'm also thinking, well, like, I can always go back, I can always go back to academia. Yeah. But to go back to music and to maintain the level was, was probably impossible. So yeah. was, if I want to try it, I have to try it now. So um, what was your favourite instrument then? What so percussion. Okay. So very, very broad. You know, so yeah. drum kit, jazz, funk, all through to orchestral, um, and everything in between, piano, and bassoon, bizarre. Yeah. So I think, you know, in sort of reasonably conservative um, central Scotland, um, you know, peer, peers going off to do accountancy and law, and I was going off to, to bang drums in Manchester. It was uh, yeah. a little bit unusual. <laughs> um but really enjoyed it. My parents, you know, massive thanks to them, respect to them for supporting me to give it a go. Did it, really enjoyed it three years, but did work out during that three years. It probably wasn't the long-term path. I'd always been interested in business. Yeah. And, and then changed, changed tack. At, at that. And when was the moment you thought, I'd probably got to go down the sort of sensible route here. I think there were a number of points where I thought about it. I think the, the two main you know, reasons as to why would be, it's hard, you know, you had to be 100% obsessed, committed, I think, to really drive it through. And I realised, you know, you'd have, you'd have go out for a coffee in the morning at college and people obsessing about their latest, you know, timpani stick and the bounce of that. And I, and I probably hadn't <laughs> got yeah, yeah. that level of obsession. Um, and I also I knew I had options. Yeah. So um, my parents, it wasn't, it wasn't the easiest conversation to go back home and tell dad that... Um, I had a great three years, but I'm going to yeah. <laughs> go down a different path. Um, but again, they were they were really supportive. Um, so I, I did that and stayed in Manchester. And you've and you and your whole career has been based around Manchester. Pretty it has, it has. So I only I, I mean, who knows what I would have end where I would have ended up if I hadn't gone to music college. You know, I guess most people in Scotland, not most, an awful lot do stay in Scotland. Um, but that took me down to Manchester, and then back then because. It was a different role entirely in terms of, of, of using university and college fees. But, you know, you, we got grants for the fees for the first degree, didn't for the second. So I stayed in Manchester principally because okay. I was able to use my musical contacts to earn money through gigs, teaching, augmented by a bit of bar work and to pay for my, my fees myself. So was, all, my, all, my, all, my, all my mates on the course were getting a grant on day one. I was having to pay, yeah. pay money over to the bursar to... Uh, so, so that was the reason for staying in Manchester. And then as my career evolved, it's just a great city. And I think it's just got a great, it's, it's probably quite like Glasgow in a way, which I thought was closest to yeah. in Scotland in terms of the, the, the people, the humour. It's quite down to earth. It's very friendly. Um, and it's big enough to be a proper market mm -hmm. when I got into, into the sort of corporate finance world, but it's still small enough that actually relationships do matter yeah. and behaviour is therefore really important. And um, so there's always been the call of the of London, obviously I'm here much more now, but yeah. 
still very much Horn is, is in the northwest. So tell us, in your words, what does BGF do? So BGF, in it, at its simplest level, is providing growth capital, so equity funding, mm. into small and medium-sized businesses across the UK and Ireland. And we do that, and there's a couple of us, probably a few aspects to that that really differentiate what we do. Um, so everything we do is minority investment, which is very important. So lots of um, institutions provide minority, but it's everything. All that we do is minority. So hugely important, not just the document, but how we behave as yeah. a junior partner to the entrepreneurs that we back. We invest from our balance sheet. So we've got our, our funds, our capital comes from our four primary shareholders, which are four UK um, high street banks. So just go over who's So that? Barclays, HSBC, Lloyds and Matt West. Yeah. So they've been hugely supportive from the off and provider capital. Having that capital on our balance sheet gives us a hugely strengthened position in how we can provide support mm. um, to, to the companies that we back. So hugely flexible in how we structure on day one. I think really important and arguably I mean, very topical, um, we can continue to support a business through quite a, a, a long period of a business's evolution. So we can start off supporting a business with you know, one, two million and go all the way as we have done up to sort of 40 million over a long period. So that's the check size is between one and 40 million. Then. So one and 20 on day one, but over time, yeah. we can, we can, so, so, so I think we can continue to support businesses. We go one, one of the first deals I did um, at BGF, this obviously dates it when I was very much on the tools up in Yorkshire, you know, we backed two and a half million of investment um, in 2012. We're still an investor in that business now and we're up at, you know, well past 30 million. I've continued to support the entrepreneur and, and the business to continue to grow. Um, unlike many businesses where they are, they have a sweet spot of capital and then a new investor has to be brought in. So that flexibility is, is, is huge. The fact it's not a fund, um, so it means we don't have the timelines. So again, when we were set up, it was right trying to ensure that we could be as flexible as possible and, and, and as, 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 as supportive as possible. So we don't have a fixed end date on yeah. capital. So that business in particular, you know, we've been an investor there for 11 years. We, we might sell in the short term. We could we could stay in the rest of the forever, see meaningful period of time from from here on in. That's absolutely fine. So huge flexibility. So although most entrepreneurs we back do want to have a capital event at some point, the fact that they know that we're not under undue time constraints is a huge positive. And a capital event, IPO or exit. Yes, generally. Of, right? of, generally, so most from what we've seen, typically that be trade a trade a trade buyer. So a, a large a large our company coming in to, to acquire the company or um, sometimes a private equity company coming in to do a majority um, PE investment. And what's the origin story of BGF? Because you've been here almost since day one. Yes, so really really from the beginning. So the origins were very clear to, to fill a gap in the funding landscape. So many commentators, people in the industry, politicians had a pretty strong view that um, SMEs were underserved in the provision of equity capital. Um, so we were set up to, to fill that gap, and as touched on earlier, very keen that we were established in a way that made us as attractive as we possibly could do to entrepreneurs, but at the same time establishing us in a way that was to ensure we had every chance that we possibly could have of being a commercially sustainable business. So we weren't being set up just to, to, to provide sort of grants to business. It was doing it in a way that we were set up independently from, from the banks, independently from government, um, you know, recruiting and experienced people from the industry and, and to do things in a different way. Talk to us about, well, firstly, when should entrepreneurs begin to sort of get in touch with you? When, when, when are you sort of looking for that? And then we'll kind of get on to like, yeah, you know, because you've got big offices here and we'll get on to some of that side. But when should entrepreneurs mm -hmm. begin to get in touch with BGF about money? I think many of our best relationships and there's a broad range, but we've got many relationships where we have made an investment having first met the business and really the entrepreneur or entrepreneurs in question years before. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be that way by, by any stretch, but we do put a lot of time and effort, you know, trying to go out to market, meet businesses, meet entrepreneurs, 
that probably links into one of the key points I didn't mention earlier on, which I think is really important in terms of our model. And again, back to the, the filling a gap point, um, part of the perception of, of, of the gap being not just the type of capital, but the regional aspect um, of, mm. of, of funding. But by that, I mean, obviously, that um, whilst there's a lot of capital sitting in London, the southeast, definitely not the case to the same extent, you know, elsewhere across um, UK, uh, UK and Ireland. So we've now got 15 offices um, and I think we've started with four. So we've, we've yeah. obviously been really seeing the benefits of actually being on the ground. And the point obviously being, you know, being on the ground, we can get to know much better companies over a long period of time. So there is no, I think, right, right answer, but I think, I think getting to know us early, getting to know any potential investor early yeah. is it has to be a good thing to do. I think uh, not, not just in terms of getting relationship established, but I think it's getting guidance. So again, many of our, you know, in a way, so the easier investments to make, you know, businesses that we've met, businesses who've taken the advice might be from us or from other parties who've maybe, you know, for example, really strengthened their boards, brought yeah, their yeah. executive, for example. Um, and that's one of the big things, right, is, is financial capital is very important, but also that, that cultural, social and skills capital almost, mm. and scaling capital, if that's uh, a phrase that could be used in terms of that is one of the things the UK really has lacked over the last 20 years. So talk to us about what else BGF provides on that. The, probably the primary area, or the most obvious area that we provide support is, is people. Yeah. And that's through our talent network, yeah. as, as we call it. And that's actually, you know, it, it's around about 6,000 know, contacts that we have. And obviously there are varying degrees of, of relationship um, amongst that, but we've been, even from the really early days, really uh, overwhelmed, frankly, by the level of interest. It's very seasoned um, people, either you know, entrepreneurs themselves from a corporate world who want to re-engage and, and help and support um, smaller businesses. And I think because of the volume that we do, we're generally backing small-ish businesses who are taking on capital to do something quite exciting. Yeah, They're really interested and they want to give something back. Um, so we've had you know fantastic interest from some you know really high quality um, individuals. So that's a really important part of our offering. Um, in every investment we make, pretty much there will be an independent non-executive chair appointed. Okay. Often that's from our our um, talent network. It doesn't have to be, but a bit often it is. But that talent network is also hugely important in terms of then it could be executive roles, it could just be advice, it could be contacts. And we've seen huge merits there. And I think, you know, doing that on a sector basis, we've seen really hugely important, um, you know, international, um, you know, a, a sort of um, more um, sort of um, situationally in terms of, you know, whether it be IP or wh wh any sort of area, we've got a huge range of people Definitely. that we can introduce. And I think we've just seen, you know, massive, massive benefits from that and huge positive feedback from the entrepreneurs that we've um, how many deals are you doing roughly a year and how much capital are you deploying? So, so we're now so 12, 12 years in and I think we've found a reasonable uh, sort of steady state um, for, the, for, the, for the short term certainly of deploying in the region of 500 million a year. Yeah. And that would typically equate to doing round about 50 new investments a year. Yeah. Um, but a, a, a meaningful part of that 500 million, as I touched on earlier, would be our follow-on funding. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's possibly um, you know, sort of you know, two to one as a ratio of often new, new to, to okay. follow-on funding. So really very active. Yeah. And um, we are generalist, so we, um, we're happy to invest pretty much in any sectors. There's a couple of, sort of technical constraints that we have. But we, we really want to be open-minded and prepared to look at pretty much any business that we can, you know, right across, across the UK and Ireland. But having said that, you know, we, we have built up an awful lot of knowledge over the years. And some of us have been around for, you know, <laughs> hence the grey hair, you know, quite a few years before that. So we do have a lot of insight um, and we try and get the right balance of having regional teams yeah. engaging regionally, but then leveraging really strong sector insight and, and using that to help support the, the businesses that we, that we back. Because you were previously head of investments, right? So what yeah. did that role sort of, were you the one that was signing off? the final kind of investment of those 50 a year? 
Um, well, it's something I've, I've a meaningful voice, definitely, in that. So my, my role's evolved very gradually over the period, which has been, been massively rewarding to be part of. So I just so going, going back to the beginning, so my, I joined, touched on earlier, before we'd made a single investment, so it was a bit of faith for me and for many others, I, I hasten to add. Um, and and I joined I joined back then, despite you know a degree of uncertainty. You know who knows how it actually would pan out, but I think the the, the opportunity to get involved in something like this at the beginning was is mm-hmm. hugely attractive. You know probably a once in a generational lifetime something of, of this scale that was doing something different. That's the other sort of key point. So being able to be involved in something that was, you know, doing something different that had a real purpose to a real, a real sort of new UK need was again hugely exciting. And I'd, I'd always worked in regional private equity at the smaller end, where you do get more involved in businesses. So that was the reason for joining. And then the role gradually evolved to um, setting up in Manchester, then Leeds, then we took on Scotland, we set up in Ireland, then head of investments. And uh, head of investments, point back to your question. So then. I suppose yes, that ultimate <laughs> responsibility, you know, sitting there, which you know does does weigh reasonably heavily. There's yeah. a, lot, a lot of decision making, and then when once you've made that decision, and the, and the true, the same is absolutely true for the for the entrepreneur taking the investment. You know, once once we've made an investment, it, there, there's, there's definitely I think the the, the marriage metaphor is used, analogy is used, used a few times. Mm. That is, you know, once once you're committed, you are, you are committed. And what traits are you looking for in entrepreneurs and businesses? Very good question, and I think I think the whole I think we we engage with our part of the of the market, you know, it's sort of real entrepreneurs, which I think is just just fascinating, absolutely fascinating. They are typically not always, but typically first time founders, mm-hmm. often you know family businesses to a large degree, and um, you know they are they are wired in ways that many of us who are you know I have to confess you know accountants and um, uh, bankers and everything else, and they arrive very differently, which enables them yeah. to be driven and, and, and achieve what what they achieve. Um, and I would say, as as we've continued to evolve, and we touched on it a little bit earlier, the importance of, of, of teams and skill. Mm. Um, we obviously a committee. We talk a lot about you know the market, the business, you know, financials, the, the the transaction, the deal structure, and all of that. But I would say increasingly the the most significant discussion is on on people and management, mm-hmm. and then you know what what are we looking for? Um, I mean, it's, it's probably the, it's the obvious in terms of you know the ambition, the drive, but the clarity of strategy I think really important. But often recognizing, but again to what we we're discussing earlier, I mean, in terms of um, people often need help with that because yeah. it's not and that's not meant to be at all condescending but just the importance of thinking you know years ahead yeah. of, of how and, and again very difficult for entrepreneurs perhaps to take that view if they've not got a, a robust balance sheet or, or a clear funding partner but really with the benefit of many people's inputs you know where do we really want the business collectively to be in x years time um but i think the, the point that was coming back to in terms of the committee conversation what we're looking for is 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 a as a complete team because it's recognizing, you know, for any founder running a small business, building it, growing it is really, really hard. <laughs> really, really hard. Over the last few years, with all the uncertainty that we've had, you know, even yeah. harder. Uh, that's not changing, obviously, in the short term by any stretch. But not only is that difficult, but then back to what we're doing, we're typically providing a chunk of meaningful chunk of capital to those businesses for them to execute an ambitious, exciting growth plan. So even harder again and are arguably often taking the business down a path that it's not been down before. Yeah. So it's working out how, how can we help the, often is, you know, the founder, the founders collectively work out, you know, what's the right shape of team, strength of team to actually execute that, that plan and give the business the best chance possible. And what, you know, often, for example, resilience, which you kind of touched on there is a uh, factor in sort of great entrepreneurs. What are the other sort of, you know, kind of key makeup of an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. do you think, out of all the kind of investments you've done over the years? What was that sort of pattern recognition? Well, I think resolving, yeah, as you say, I mean, it's, it's, it's right up there. I mean, it, it, it just has to be. And again, I think they just have to have that, that the level of drive, belief, 
um, but it gives them the resilience then to absorb, you know, the ups and downs that are just inevitable. Yeah. Um, you know, as as, a, as an entrepreneur, but linking it back to what we've been talking about, I think as well as then having the resilience, you know, the focus, the drive, the ambition is being open to influence. Mm. And obviously, there's a fine balance there. Not being really too sort of pig-headed. It, it, well, it, I would I would never use that. No, not not use it, like, <laughs> too hard-headed, maybe. Um, but I think the balance of retaining that drive, the focus, the ambition, but being open to influence, probably is one of the key assessments yeah, yeah, that we that we would make. Because I think where we where we get the best of both worlds, that's a really powerful combination. Where you've got great founder or founders who are then augmented by you know other skill sets coming in they will often, that, that combination will often result in the, in the best result. What's the biggest difference that you've noticed moving from Chief Investments Officer to being CEO? Because you've done it for a year now, just for a bit. Yes, of yes. Know. So it's a, it's, a, it's a year in. I think the, the massive positive is that having gone through a, over 12 years, a pretty organic evolution within the business, and obviously I've played a pretty major role in in shaping the team you know over the last 12 years means that I've got a great team around me which again makes that a far easier step than it might have been otherwise. What's been the most challenging bit of becoming a CEO? Questions like this on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good gal. <laughs> Flattery okay. Um, there probably is an element of that I think I think you yeah, are. Yeah you're a face a, right like it, 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 it's a shift right? Yeah so, I think being being the the front person being yeah, the yeah. spokesperson the ultimate spokesperson and and we are like it or not we are we're not a public business but we are a very high profile business yeah we come under a lot of scrutiny so trying to you know get the messaging you know right um externally and internally which is not straightforward because we are a large complex yeah. business um, so that, that, that does that does uh, that does weigh not heavily, but it's certainly it's not inconse- inconsequential. Yeah, it's a sh- it's a shift, right? And it's not always um, straightforward, like like you say. And um, what's the you know, you've been going for a bit longer than a decade now. What mm. do you see as the sort of next ten years of BGF, right? Like what what sectors are coming down the line that kind of excite you, and you know, just you know, what changes are we going to see in the investment landscape? Do you think? Yeah. Well, I think I think stepping right back mm. from that question, I suppose where, where do I want we want I want particularly the business to be, and it's back to the point that we were set up as an independent commercial business to be sustainable. So, so that's what we need to continue, and you know, for for, for one second, be complacent about that. I think we've made a very good start. Mm. Um, the last few years, we've really seen our exit activity, you know, ramp up. So, you know, over over 80 exits in, in 21 and 22, you know, really right, positive returns. Um, so that's been great. We need to continue to deliver. Um, so that, that's hugely important. And then doing that, and I'm sure we can do that, and we will do that, leading all we can to ensure that we're going to be here in 10, 20 years' time yeah. as the, you know, aspirational go-to funding partner for SMEs. So that, yeah. that's where I want us to, to, to be. Um, that, that would be, you know, massive, massive success. And by that point, you know, maybe some graduates that they just recruited, you know, mm. coming in, sitting here, yeah. talking to someone, or maybe even still you, uh, yeah. I mean, depending on your uh, longevity. But um, so that fund- fundamentally, that's where I want us to be. What does that look like by that point? And what will change, back to your question, over 10 years? I mean, it, it is very difficult to say there is definitely scope for us to do a lot more. Yeah. Um, I think we are still very much maturing in certain parts of the country. So back to the importance of us being, you know, outside London, in the southeast. You know, it was reasonably recently we set up a permanently staffed office in Newcastle. Yeah. Um, we were making great inroads and progress in Cardiff. Um, we had our just had our first couple of exits in Northern Ireland. Um, well, why, why have you gone to the northeast most recently? What excites you about the northeast? I think, well, I think all, of, all of those areas, and back, back again to our purpose and, and filling a gap, there are just lots of great companies mm-hmm. and great entrepreneurs. And they're just, 
the way the way things have naturally evolved with such a concentration, but to some extent inevitable, perhaps in you know, London and the southeast, they do not have the same infrastructure yeah. support. It's not the same advisory base. There's not the same sort of case studies or maybe entrepreneurial peers that are around. Lots of different reasons that just I think result in there being less activity, despite the fact you've got you know great great skills. You know, northeast I guess, tech particularly in a real yeah. sort of um, stronghold from a tech perspective. You know, and other sectors as well and um, you know great academic institutions up there so lots going on but i think you know whether it's there northern ireland be another good example where they just not arguably had the case studies mm. of of perhaps family businesses who have been comfortable taking on institutional capital and then taking that and the support and then ultimately having a fantastic result for the family and and perhaps those parts of the UK and Ireland, they'd, they'd probably naturally been a bit more cautious yeah. in terms of their appetite to bring on capital. So I think there's much more we can do. And I think, you know, we spent a lot of time you know, working with our marketing team of you know, how can we raise the profile of those individuals? So, I mean, U-Form was our first exit in a family um, you know, kitchen kitchen door business, but, but just they just did it really, really well. Yeah. Very successful. Um, grew it very well. And it ended up being a great result for them. Um, they've still got stake in the business. We've actually reinvested alongside, um, you know, majority PE coming in. So the more we can raise the profile, support, infrastructure, events, hopefully that will just encourage more activity across the, across the UK now. We recently had Ross Linsett on from uh, Recite Me, who was yep. sort of very positive about all that you guys had, had done in the North East supporting that. To go from kind of kitchen doors and so on that you mentioned there, which is a very kind of traditional mm. business, what do you think the impact of AI is going to be, right? It's the hot topic that everyone's talking about. What do you think as a, a company internally for what you do as, as well as externally mm. and mm. the companies you're going to be investing in? Mm. I think there must be a raft of different ways in which it can help us, as you said quite rightly, in, internally even before we yeah, think yeah. about um, you know, the many companies that we support. And I think particularly because of the scale that we have and the volume of activity. So again, but just to reinforce how different we are from, from most um, you know, institutional equity businesses. Um, so one of our key challenges is how, how do we prioritize? How do we filter? I'm sure it can help in that regard. Um, Decision-making, we touched on the investment committee earlier. That's very subjective. Yeah. Um, we all have our own scars from investments that we've made in the past and also our own success stories in the past that probably can unduly influence us. So again, how can we use AI to perhaps bring another perspective uh, yeah. into decision-making? I think it would be interesting. How do you get away from those kind of like unconscious biases that you talk about on an investment committee? Because of course that's partly what you're paid to do, right? Is use that experience yeah. to make the judgments, right? So how, how do you sort of guard against that? It's a, it's a really good question, and I'm not sure you can entirely. Being a, a, yeah, yeah. You, you have to, re I think, I think the, the first part of it obviously is recognizing that we will have these, these, these unconscious biases, um, or maybe if you do realize that, maybe it's then it's, it's a conscious bias. But, um, but the, 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 that tendency, we definitely uh, recognize. There's probably a number of different ways in which we do it, so we, we try and again, back to efficiency, but back to our talent network, we will get lots of insight from them on the deals that we're looking to do. Okay. So we tend, to, which, which helps us, so it's, it's pretty inexpensive, so it's, it's efficient, it, it costs less for the companies that we're looking to back from a diligence process, but we get some really great insight from, from people that we already know through our talent network, who can be real ex experts in the sector. We mentioned earlier, we will typically look for the company to appoint an independent non-executive. Um, that process will start long before we invest. So candidates for that will meet the business, they'll meet the entrepreneur, they will have great insight. Um, in our life sciences and um, clean tech, which is where we really focus on in deep tech in our earlier stage investing, um, we have uh, two advisory boards. Um, okay. Some really experienced, you know, high quality uh, caliber of individuals who can who can um, help us assess. So a number of different ways we try and try and triangulate and get lots of input from different sources. And what what skills are you looking for at the entry level? You mentioned graduates earlier mm. and so on. So let's say there's people at university listening to this and so on and just think, gosh, it sounds really interesting company, lots of opportunities, 
you know, to take my career in different stages. What, what's the sort of the key attributes that you're looking for on your kind of graduate program? Well, I think that's obviously really early um, in terms yeah. of the, the evolution of an investor. Um, I think we've seen the graduate program as a really exciting way of bringing on a, a broader skill set. And obviously, they're, you know, they're, they're not, they haven't been shaped yet by yes. any experience, which I think is a big positive. So touched on it earlier and, and confessed to you my accountancy background. You know, many of us are accountants. That is quite important. A lot of we do, what we do is numbers, but it's really important that we have a balance yeah, and, yeah. Um, and have a broader mix of, of perspectives. So I think the graduate program will bring in a broader just mindset. People who haven't been shaped in a, in a certain way, which would be really good. I'm going down a slight tangent here, but I think it's important. I'll come back to the, the core the core question. I think that's also helping us bring in a more diverse, not just from a, maybe a sort of a mental perspective or a, um, how they approach decision making, mm. um, but just diverse in terms of their socioeconomic background, um, you know, gender, race, whoever it may be. So we we we, we are very focused on and trying to ensure that we have a, a very broad. Um, mm range of graduates um, coming in um, and it's still really quite early days for us to see how, how they come through. Yeah. The skill sets that I think they really will need, back to your question, to really then come through and be a really fantastic investor within BGF. And I think what we need is probably quite different perhaps from conventional private equity because, because of the volume that we do, we actually need investors to be doing more, taking on more responsibility much earlier than they perhaps would do elsewhere. So, you know, we typically have pretty small teams, you know, doing a number of deals each year. So they really do get involved and there's a lot of responsibility um, resting uh, with a lot of support as well, I hasten, I hasten to add. But to do that, what do they need? There's, I mean, there's obviously there's the commercial skills, you know, numbers I mean, touched on earlier. I think the most, probably the two most important ones would be um, the commercial nows. Yeah, which and it's very hard to assess, but I think people obviously you know evolve that and that, that that matures over a period of time. But I think commercial now is as to what does a good deal look like? What does a good deal look like for an entrepreneur? And how can we try and create a solution um, for right. entrepreneurs? Um, is is really important? You know, how do we triage a massive funnel of opportunities? Um, and then the other key bit that relates to that is people skills. Yeah. So we. You know, we are needing to. It's not. It is not by any stretch just a commercial transaction where we're putting in a term sheet. Let's, let's sort of win the deal on on a pricing sheet at all. These are entrepreneurs, and if they choose to go down our path, and many entrepreneurs that we speak to, you know, many will do nothing yeah. because they're you know great businesses. They don't have to do anything. They may choose to take on um, no funding at all. They may take a little bit of debt funding. They may just choose to wait and and, and sell to trade down the line. If we want to persuade them. Um, to go down our path, and that could be a you know a partial liquidity event, i selling some shares to us directly, um, as well as some growth capital, and then you know sort of going for a more ambitious growth plan, mm. but they stay in control. We need to win their hearts and minds, and they need to trust us. And how and how do you manage that? Because that's a really interesting thing. Yeah, when Rishi Sunak came on the show, like he was like, we need to encourage businesses from going from like tens of millions of pounds to hundreds of millions to you know half billion and billion yep. you know that is it's really hard to kind of for sometimes entrepreneurs who you know start out at a kitchen table to kind of envisage mm. that sort of um business how do you and you're one of the key kind of components in this how do you persuade entrepreneurs to do that the ambition <sighs> point so the the ambition the ambition the point, point yeah like, how, well i think because you talk there about some saying, oh, actually, we're not going to do this, which is fair, right? Mm. And, and so on. But, you know, you're partly a really big part of that kind of like cultural. Yes. And I think, I think we need to play a bigger part in that. I think, I think, it, I think it is really important that, 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 you know, more scale-ups need, you know, longer term sort of funding roadmaps, as it were, so they can continue to scale. So I think that is really, really important to cross the UK. And that doesn't just involve us by any stretch. I think to an extent that they just have to have ambition themselves in them. I think that there's a, there's a, you can't easily, I think, persuade someone that that has to be there to a degree. Having said that, I think what we do try and do, and again, it's the huge benefit of case studies and being able to point to previous experiences, is demonstrate what the art of the possible is. 
Mm. So I think arguably far too many entrepreneurs, and again, we were talking about um, you know, Northern Ireland as an example um, earlier on, and particularly where they can't point to the case studies, arguably in terms of selling out way too early, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it could be said in some situations. So I think if they can understand there's a different path where they can still retain control or certainly retain sufficient influence um, and actually just stay on the journey for much, much longer. And there's a way of bringing in the skills, you know, as we've been speaking about, to enable the team to be strengthened, to execute a, a plan. Um, I think hopefully many, many more should be able to then be, be, be comfortable going down that longer term path. And, and we have got some great examples of that. So uh, in the Northwest, you know, close to my heart, we, mm. we backed uh, 2016, I think it was, uh, Kids Planet, a nursery business. Yes. Um, again, a family business. And uh, backed again, again, a really um, you know, strong family team, buy and build. The team was augmented. Um, we put a lot of additional follow-on capital um, into that business. Private was that came Jenny, in. Was that Jenny Johnson? That's Kids Unlimited. Um, this is Claire Roberts. It's Roberts right. family. Um, Claire Roberts and family. Um, and they've gone on taking PE investment and they're still going. Yeah. We, we've retained a stake. And you know, who knows where that could end up. Um, but it could have been quite easy for them to say otherwise, actually, the business has gone really well. We've got a, a great size check. Let's just call it a day and, um, and, and, and move on. And they yeah. haven't done. And the more and more, and particularly actually, you know, a female, you know, female CEO. So again, back to role models. Yeah, that's uh, another very important part of, of what we believe we should be doing more of, and, and raising the profile of is is diverse, diverse founders, and particularly um, you know, the likes of, of of Claire, you know, very successful um, female CEOs. What's another example of a company in the north of England that people might not sort of associate with necessarily taking investment capital? That's uh, that is interesting. So yeah, so we we do back you know many mentioned earlier you know very broad approach to sectors. So some of the you know more exciting you know life sciences tech we've touched on. In Yorkshire, we exited a couple of years ago a business that probably isn't massively high profile outside of the um, Yorkshire Northeast. The Couplins, you know, bakery mm. business, family owned, I think through generations actually, oh, right. yeah. and. Really high quality business. Um, Paul, I think, I, I think third generation um, founder looking for a solution as to, to help and how they take the business forward. So again, definitely fits into that category of, of a strong business, plenty of options of, of people who would want to provide capital. But again, someone who was cautious about you know the right step for the business, you know, massively, not just about the capital, what's the, what's the right home for the business. And how does he, how does he transition out of the business himself? So we worked with them, um, with a, very much with our talent network team, brought in a more sort of corporate, you might say, CEO, um, Belinda, a CFO, um, more capital going in for growth. Uh, business continued to grow, but then ultimately exited in a way which um, gave the the family a full, complete exit. Yeah. Amazing. Which was was fantastic, and I think you know gave gave Paul and the family a solution that they were really keen to get that I don't think anyone else could have easily okay. perhaps given. You know, he would have been probably very wary of going down a more conventional, you know, majority yeah, yeah, yeah. PE path, for example. I'm not saying you know other people could have done it, but I think it did fit very much with the combination it's of what? our form of capital, and particularly that that that's again that recurring theme really of of helping with succession and team evolution. Um, if you were final two questions. A great book that you've read recently it doesn't necessarily have to be business. Um, and also, if you were in your early twenties, in the twenty twenties, what do you think your career path would be? Where would you be looking to start out? You know, whilst on holiday, I did read the book, which I, I've actually forgotten the exact title now, but something along the lines of you know everyone else is an, an idiot, which I think is about the the colour profiling of different colour profiling of different personality types. Yes. Yeah. 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 And just really interesting thinking about our own team, people that we've backed, um, how we work together, um, you know, very thought provoking. Um, we are continuing to do more and more ourselves as a business in terms of, you know, much more 360 feedback um, in a more senior level, much more providing coaching development plans. Mm. Um, so, so 
arguably a bit dry for a for a holiday read, <laughs> but it did it, was, it, it did sort of resonate in terms of just that that insight into how we're all different in different ways, and then the more we can understand each other. Um, the more and, and our, understand ourselves, frankly, you know, much more chance we've actually got of working together well. And career um, as a team, and career and bit of advice you might give. The thing it was interesting. So like we do, we have been doing for a few years the an intern program, mm. um, and again for this uh, similar themes as we were saying earlier, the graduate program. I've been on a very broad range across the country, very broad range of different profiles, and and we do do a session, you know with the CEO and, and part of it is, is you know, yeah, yeah. trying to give some pointers and trying not to feel, I do always feel very, very old at the end of it because they're all horribly annoyingly young and, but also <laughs> really very smart and yeah. thoughtful and ask smart questions. And then I, I then I worry about, you know, do, do my, um, are my views actually still relevant now because of you know, the world has moved on so much and I'm sure some aren't and, and hopefully some are. So, so I have the benefit on, on yeah, this question yeah. of having it some, giving it some thought before. There's a number of different thoughts I would give. I mean, one of the obvious ones, I guess, given, given my rather non-traditional non, uh, unorthodox career path is there's not a rush. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, and I think, you know, and, and I guess you've got people just now, you know. The modern world like is very like, yeah, yeah. It kind of It's about, you know, making decisions and, you know, qualifications, graduates and, you know, which university, what you know, it, it, that does not define you, you know, and, and you can take many different steps before ultimately you may end up in the right, in the right path. So I think, I think I would really, and I, I will labor that point, my own children, they probably won't listen to me, um, they, they obviously, um, as a father, but um, that would be a really important part, I think. Um, so not to prejudge where you want to get to. I didn't, I didn't even know, I didn't even know our industry existed yeah, I think, yeah. when I when I first took um, on on a role in accountancy. So you know, don't don't be in a rush. I think people and behaviours again. I think if I look back, you know, where I've really enjoyed working, and again, it's and it's, and it's easy for someone to say later in a career. You know, it's not all about the capital or the money. It, it is making sure you're somewhere where you feel fulfilled and the people. Makes so sense. how you behave to others, and it's a long term game building relationships. Um, Hugely important. I said that was going to be my final two questions, but I slightly lied because I, I forgot <laughs> what. I, as a musician, I really wanted to know what your Desert Island Disc song would be in terms of the one that you'd take to the island. Just if I ever get the uh, Desert Island Disc yeah. doing chord up one day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to try it out now, basically. <laughs> That's just a nasty question. So for, some, for someone who's a bit of a music geek, that is just a nasty, nasty question to, to ask. And I, I, am, I am a bit of a geek. I, was, I, do, I do think about, you know, I, I do listen to the programmes, which we all do occasionally yeah, 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 on, the, on the podcast. So your mind does wander there. Ten would be, or eight is it now? I think it is eight. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, one is, um, and I, I, I remember getting very... Um, strong feedback as to how odd I was in my sort of formative years where I'd spend my paper money, I'd, I'd go and buy a, a record from Woolworths or whatever it was, yeah, um, yeah. You know, and I'd, I'd come back with a, a bit of Mozart and a bit of ACDC. So <laughs> <laughs> quite odd early on it's in some respects. Um, so it's, so therefore even harder yeah, to, yeah. to, so I've given my, I'm obviously padding out here to give myself a bit more time to think of something. If I had to choose one, this probably betrays my, um, my my roots and heritage, um, I think, would be the Blue Nile. Okay, great. Um, and probably I walk across the rooftops for their first album. So Glasgow band. I don't know if you. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, a bit like me, but in respect, a bit sort of downbeat, melancholy, but hopefully, I think, uh, um, you know, actually quite optimistic. Um, yeah, yeah, behind, totally. behind it all. I think that suits you quite well, actually. That's, that's, that sums up very well. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, yeah. Andy, thanks very much for coming on Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. Pleasure. Thank you.